Okay, Mrs. Lincoln, this is it. One last push, and we're done. Hang! <clears throat> Nine months and four days ago, my father brought forth upon my mother himself and gave to her a child, conceived in a shack in Kentucky, and dedicated to the proposition that I will drink num-nums from a bottle and do little poo-poos in my pants for the next two to three years. Now what does it babies do again? Oh yeah. I am not touching that. Abraham Lincoln grew up with his relatively poor family in Kentucky, eventually moving to Indiana, and finally, Illinois. He read a lot of books, worked a lot of jobs, wrote some questionable poetry, and finally entered the law profession. Despite being self-taught, he turned out to be a pretty clever and astute lawyer. In one case, a guy claimed he witnessed a murder at night, and Lincoln was like, how could you have seen anything in the dark? There was a bright full moon. A what? A bright full moon. Can you say that again, please? There was a bright full moon. A dim half moon? No, a bright full moon. That's funny, because according to this almanac, there was a dim half moon that night, which makes you a liar. Uh, well, I got a bright full moon for y'all right here. Now that's what I call a rebuttal. Lincoln and his cheekbones weren't only interested in law, however. He also dabbled in the world of politics, serving as a legislator in both local and national assemblies. And what a time it was. Not even a hundred years after the Founding Fathers wrote, all men are created equal, politicians were already asking, yeah, but what does that mean exactly? It means all men. Yeah, but what does that mean exactly? And not just that. States' rights versus the federal government. What are the executive powers of the president? Is cereal a soup? The Founding Fathers left some of these questions perhaps a little too open to interpretation. And the biggest question of them all was slavery, an ugly mark on what should have been a revolutionary new nation based on liberty and democracy. Thomas Jefferson had written a condemnation of slavery in the Declaration of Independence, but out of fear of losing Southern states' support, it was removed. Hey guys, do you think leaving this a little vague will create any unforeseen problems in the future? Cannonball! And those unforeseen problems were now beginning to rear their ugly heads. As the nation developed, the North and the South developed along two very different lines, and two very different cultural identities emerged. Northern cities began rapidly industrializing, while the Southern climate allowed for large plantations of labor-intensive crops. As a result, one half of the country didn't rely on slaves, while the other half had become economically dependent on them. In 1793, Eli Whitney's cotton gin caused the slave trade in the South to explode. While in the North, a growing abolitionist movement was taking root, a general mistrust began to develop between the North and the South. As Northerners felt the South were hell-bent on expanding slavery, and fear spread throughout the South that the North wanted to take their slaves away. In 1819, there were 11 free states and 11 slave states. A perfect balance, a happy medium, a harmonious relationship. Hey guys, nice to meet you. I'm Missouri, and I would like to become the 23rd state. Hey buddy, welcome to the nation. We'll be happy to accept you as a free state. Oh no you don't. You're trying to get one over on us. Missouri's gonna be a slave state. Okay, listen, why don't we just ask Missouri what it wants to be, and we slave state. Well, then, uh, allow me to introduce to you the newest, freshest state on the scene, Maine. Hey, you can't do that, and you can't have any more slave states above this line. What? The issue of slavery is solved, and it will never come up again. A few years later, it came up again. You see, as America expanded westward, each new state or territory that was added threatened to upend the delicate balance between the slave and free states. If one faction managed to outnumber the other, it could gain an easy majority and force its own ideals on the opposing side, leaving a huge portion of the population feeling spiteful and oppressed. For a while, compromises kicked the can down the road and kept the volatile balance in check, as new free and slave states were roughly added in pairs. But then one loudmouth state just had to barge in and ruin everything as usual. The addition of Texas saw the United States enter into a war with Mexico, which they won, gaining a huge amount of land out west and creating even more problems. Hey guys, nice to meet you. I'm California, and I would like to become the 31st state. Hey buddy, welcome to the nation. We'll be happy to accept you as a southern slave state. Oh no you don't. You're trying to get one over on us. California's gonna be a free state. Okay, listen, why don't we just ask California what it wants to be, and we can free state. Well, then, uh, 
allow me to introduce to you the territories of New Mexico and Utah, able to freely vote for slavery themselves. Hey, you can't do that. And we can enter Northern Territory anytime we want to recapture escaped slaves. What? The issue of slavery is solved and it will never come up again. A few years later, it came up again. In 1854, a Democratic senator from Illinois wanted to build a really cool choo-choo train here and proposed that the territories of Kansas and Nebraska be created open to slavery, even though they were clearly above the Missouri Compromise Line. Obviously, the northern states were like, hell no. But the southern Democrats who controlled Congress at the time were like, well, if you love liberty and democracy so much, then you should let them vote on whether slavery should be legal or not. And so it was. Huge numbers of pro and anti-slavery settlers rushed to Kansas to sway the vote in their favor. And while they were all there, they began to beat the crap out of each other. One of those settlers was a man named John Brown, a former businessman who failed at just about everything he tried and went arguably insane. He was a radical abolitionist and dedicated much of his life to the Underground Railroad and freeing slaves. One night, in revenge for an earlier raid by pro-slavery forces, he and his sons killed a number of pro-slavery settlers in the territory, helping to kickstart years of violence known as Bleeding Kansas. Kansas and Nebraska both eventually voted in favor of outlawing slavery. But from here, the tension began to grow at a rapid pace. In 1852, author Harriet Beecher Stowe penned Uncle Tom's Cabin, a best-selling novel that exposed the terrible cruelty of slavery to the world. Oh, how awful. How morally corrupt a nation must be to allow such things to happen. Your Majesty, what should we do about all the starving children working in the coal mines? Nothing! In 1854, the Republican Party was formed, and Abraham Lincoln emerged as a leading figure. Southern Democrats viewed the new Republican Party with mistrust, believing it to be radical and abolitionist. In 1856, a politician named Charles Sumner gave a speech in Congress, calling out slave-owning Democrats with fiery language. If slavery was a woman, she'd be an ugly one, and the senator from South Carolina would like to boink her. Representative Brooks, do you have a rebuttal? Oh, I have a rebuttal, all right. Yeah, here's a rebuttal for you. Oh, come on. Surely this isn't allowed. Hmm, I don't know. I'll have to consult the rule book. Hmm, I can't find anything about caning a political opponent. But it says here I'm not allowed to wear women's underwear. Uh-oh. News of the violence on the Senate floor took the nation by storm. Southern slave owners sent Representative Brooks new canes to replace his now broken one. And on the floors of Congress, politicians carried weapons in self-defense, which is never a good sign. In 1857, the Supreme Court ruled in the Dred Scott case that all people of African descent, slave or free, could not be citizens and therefore could not sue for their own freedom under any circumstances, undoing years of progress with the strike of a gavel. Now, within all this bitter debate over slavery, there were many nuances. North versus South, Republican versus Democrat, states versus the federal government. But let's strip all of that away. For 4 million individuals living in America, this wasn't about political intrigue or party alignment. It was about the basic human right to be free. Men, women, and children were stolen from their homelands and brought to the American continent, where for generations they were considered to be property, forced to live in poverty, and work from sunrise to sunset. Plantation overseers did whatever they felt was necessary to get the most out of their slaves. Punishments were often barbaric. Families were regularly separated, and parents could often only watch, as their children were auctioned off, never to be seen again. Thousands of slaves took the treacherous risk of running away, and abolitionists in the North helped many escape via the Underground Railroad, as bounty hunters entered the North to chase them down. Leading figures within the abolitionist movement included many significant free black men and women. But it's important to note that for many of the anti-slavery white individuals in the North, opposition to slavery was often an economic issue, not a moral one, as many worried large plantations would take their lands and livelihoods away. Abraham Lincoln knew that slavery was a moral evil, and he regularly spoke out against it in powerful speeches that helped him rise through the ranks of the new Republican Party. He lamented at the hypocrisy of a great American nation meant to stand as a shining beacon of freedom while also enslaving four million men, women, and children. He most famously declared in 1858 that a house divided against itself cannot stand, that one day slavery in America would end. However, even Lincoln was cautious in his opposition. He didn't want to outlaw it entirely, but simply prevent its expansion so that given enough time, he believed it would naturally die out. Thankfully, history would force his hand. In October 1859, one abolitionist decided he'd try to single-handedly take down slavery by force. Who would be crazy enough to even attempt such a thing? Ah, it's our good friend, John Brown. 
he planned to seize arms from an armory in the town of Harper's Ferry, free the slaves there, and continue south, inciting a major slave uprising along the way. A noble cause, a bad plan, and terrible execution. Brown's men took the armory and some hostages, but were quickly surrounded by one Robert E. Lee and his U.S. Marines. Brown was captured, and a couple of months later, he was executed for treason. Northerners sympathized with Brown, but Southerners were like, you see this? They're coming for us. Soon, there'll be a million John Browns. A million John Browns? What on earth are you thinking about? A John Brown farm? Yeah, me too. To make matters worse, new northern free states meant now the southern states really were outnumbered, and they were beginning to feel bitterly spiteful and oppressed. Further fear began to spread in the south when news broke that a relatively unknown figure had just secured the Republican Party nomination for president. Abraham Lincoln, mostly well-liked among anti-slavery northerners, had made some of the most powerfully worded speeches against slavery of any politician at the time. And now, there was a chance that he, and his cheekbones, could become president. For the south, that would be too much. In the 1860 election, Lincoln's name didn't even appear on the ballot in 10 southern states. But much to their horror, when the final results came in, Lincoln had won by an electoral college landslide. Lincoln himself tried to calm their fear. How many times do I have to tell you I'm not going to take away your slaves? Yeah, right, honest Abe. We've had enough of you northerners. We're going to go form our own country. You can't do that. Why not? Well, if if you had won the election, would it be okay for us to leave? Of course not. Well, why not? Because that's not how victim mentality works. Many states felt that when they joined the Union, they always withheld the right to leave it whenever they pleased. Many people living in 19th century America often felt more loyalty to their state than to the nation. And now, with the South feeling like it had lost its voice in the federal government, they were out of here. South Carolina was the first to go, and over a period of six months, one by one, 11 slave states officially seceded from the Union, with just four contested border states opting to remain. The seceding states issued a number of official documents justifying their secession. South Carolina proclaimed that it was northern states' hostility to slavery that rendered the federal government illegitimate. Mississippi declared that their position was thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery. And in a speech, the Confederate vice president stated that the new Confederate government rested upon what he called the great truth of racial inequality. Revered American generals, such as Robert E. Lee, opted to side with their states over the Union. And with all the chaos, one New York lawyer wrote that rather than a bold eagle, America's national bird should be a debilitated chicken. And hey, I kind of like that. One man, watching the crisis unfold, knew it would be his job to solve it. Lincoln was just about to hop on a train and become the president of the United States of America. Hey man, you're hella ugly. Grow a beard or something to hide that face. Hmm. Good idea. Hmm? Eh, still ugly. With assassination plots already underway, Lincoln had to travel to Washington, D.C. under heavy disguise and protection. All along the way, he received stacks of threatening letters. May the hand of the devil strike you down. You are destroying this country. Damn you, every breath you take. Love from... Grandma? At his inauguration speech, Lincoln once again reiterated that no, I do not want to take away anyone's slaves. But for Lincoln, he did want to preserve the Union. He declared secession to be nothing but an illegitimate rebellion. In your hands and not in mine, he said, is the momentous issue of civil war. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. We are not enemies, but friends. It was clear Lincoln was ready and willing to get freaky and open up a can of Scatman John if he had to. Whether he had the support of the people, however, was in question. In the end, it was the Confederates that fired the first shot. As they seceded, the Confederate states began seizing federal U.S. property throughout the South. Off the coast of Charleston, South Carolina, was one such federal property, Fort Sumter, held by a measly, undersupplied U.S. force. The Confederate militia there demanded the fort surrender, a request which was quickly denied. And any remaining hope for a peaceful solution to the secession crisis probably then died when the Confederates did this. The Battle of Fort Sumter is considered to be the beginning of the American Civil War. Many of the Confederates there also considered it to be the end of the American Civil War. They hoped Old Abe would just sigh and say, okay, you win. Unfortunately for them, Lincoln actually said, you're about to get a roundhouse to the face. Lincoln sent out the call for 75,000 volunteers and men signed up in droves, hopeful for some adventure and good old fashioned F-U-N. In the new Confederate capital at Richmond, Virginia, 
Confederate President Jefferson Davis and his cheekbones had also sent out the call for 100,000 men. As ever, both sides hoped for a quick end to the war. Is it over yet? No, Jimmy, it's been one week. Is it over now? No! How about now? If you ask that one more time, I swear I will turn this army around and you'll all have to go back home to your wives and children. But in particular, the South knew the conflict would pose a bit of a challenge. How can we expect to win with a population of only 5 million against 22 million in the North? If you count us 4 million slaves, you'd have 9 million. Great idea. Hand these rifles out to all the moon. Wait a minute. You almost had me there. The problem for Lincoln was that many of his top generals were getting old and were being a bit too cautious. The commanding general was a man named Winfield Scott, a veteran of the Mexican-American War, and by now, he was too fat to even mount a horse. Okay, chaps, we need to come up with a plan. Hit me. We could wait for the Confederates to come and apologize. Maybe we should all sit in a circle and discuss our feelings. Crossing the Delaware into New Jersey worked for me. Those are all terrible ideas. And you, wrong video. Hey, I'm the greatest president in the history of this nation. Yeah, we'll see about that, dingus. Eventually, Lincoln's generals came up with a multi-pronged strategy. First, a blockade would cut off and starve the South of supplies by sea. Secondly, taking control of the Great Mississippi River would sever the South's economic artery while splitting it in two. And finally, a main Union force in the East would move south and take the Confederate capital, ending the war. Bada boom, bada bing. Skirmishes began to break out across the nation, and the Union army in the East began to move south towards Richmond. Everything seemed to be going well until they reached Manassas, where they came upon a large Confederate force. It's almost like they were waiting for us. How did they know? As it turned out, spies in DC had sent a coded message to the Confederates warning of the invasion, both geared up for the first major battle of the Civil War. The first battle of Bull Run. The Confederates rapidly brought in support by a rail, and the two sides were about equal in numbers. However, they were also equally inexperienced. A large number of civilians also rode out by carriage from DC to picnic on the nearby hills and watch the excitement unfold. Nobody seemed to quite understand how destructive this war was going to be. The Union forces pulled a flanking maneuver to hit the Confederates on their left, and the two sides fired on each other in rows. Farm families living in the area were forced to flee the fighting, including a man named Wilmer McLean. Hurry up, Martha! There's a war out here! The more you tell me to hurry up, the slower I will go! The Union force saw initial success pushing the Confederates back to Henry Hill, but one as of yet fairly unknown General Thomas Jackson had arrived, and he took a defensive position, standing firm like a stone wall, holding the Union army off, and finally sending them running back to Washington, D.C. With heavy casualties, the sobering reality of war hit both sides hard, and the North, having just lost the first major battle, had to face the serious prospect that they may not actually win this war. President Lincoln, General Jackson whipped us so hard, the Confederates are calling him Stonewall Jackson. Wait, that's why they're calling him that? Not because he looks like he ran face first into a stone wall? Apparently not. Worse yet, the North had also lost the first major battle out west, giving away control of southwest Missouri. All of this was terrible news for Abraham Lincoln, especially since many of his generals and cabinet already didn't have much respect for him. They felt he was incapable of running a war because he seemed a bit like your friendly old grandpa. He famously loved a long-winded story and a good pun. I've been so busy, my wife is missing me. But her aim is starting to improve. <laughs> but deep down, few realized he could also be incredibly shrewd. <laughs> oh, Abe, you're so funny. Funny how? Funny like I'm a clown? Uh... Babe, I was just... No, no. Funny how? Like I'm here to amuse you? During the war, Lincoln committed acts that were viewed by some as impeachable. His administration suppressed the free media from printing articles sympathetic towards the South. Some Southern sympathizers were even arrested without a trial. Lincoln's criticizers began accusing him of being a tyrant. But to quote the man himself, Hey, it's war, baby. What are you gonna do? By the end of 1861, with things already looking bad for the North, Abolitionists such as Frederick Douglass couldn't believe that the Union Army weren't enlisting black men. He continued to put pressure on Lincoln to make the war about emancipation. Mr. President, it's time to make the war about emancipation. Hmm, I don't want to ruffle any feathers. The feathers are already ruffled. But Lincoln, hanging on to hope for a quick end to the conflict, continued to fight only for the preservation of the Union. It was decided, however, that escaped slaves from the Confederacy could be held as enemy contraband, and many of these men were put to work bolstering the Union's infrastructure and supply lines. Hoping to get things moving, Lincoln made young General George McClellan the new commanding general, and McClellan began to train up his men. He thought a lot of himself, however, and believed he was going to be the nation's great savior. And like many others, he didn't approve of the president's handling of the war. 
On one occasion, Lincoln went to McClellan's house to meet with him, but McClellan was late returning home. He kept the president waiting, and when he finally got there, he just straight up went to bed. Now that's what I call disrespectful. McClellan talked the talk, but could he walk the walk? No. Like Lincoln's other generals, McClellan was maddeningly cautious. Hey man, could you move south and attack the enemy? What? Are you crazy? What if they have a big scary army down there? They probably do. What? Oh my gosh! McClellan worried that he did not have the numbers he needed to fight effectively. What if they have like 10,000 men? Okay, no problem. We'll get you 20,000 men. Well, what if they have 30,000 men? I'll need 40. Okay, you can have 40. Well, what if they have 50? I'll need 60! Lincoln tried, but it was all in vain. McClellan would not make a move for the rest of the year. The North's one saving grace for now was a general out west fighting in Kentucky and Tennessee, General Ulysses S. Grant. Cool, collected, methodical, and a big fan of whiskey. His chief of staff took it upon himself to keep Grant sober. One officer said that Grant habitually wore an expression as though he were determined to drive his head through a brick wall and was about to do it. And that determination led him to score a number of key victories when others around him were failing. At the Battle of Fort Donelson, Grant was like, why does Stonewall Jackson get a cool nickname and I don't? I want a cool nickname. Sir, the Confederates say they're ready to surrender and want to know your terms. No terms, just unconditional surrender. Hey, unconditional surrender Grant. That's a pretty cool nickname, right? Guys, right? Later in April 1862, the Confederates launched a sudden attack on Grant's army at Shiloh, but the determined, unconditional surrender Grant threw his lines at the rebels and sent them running. The battle resulted in the heaviest casualties in US history so far. And despite his victory, Grant found himself under fire. You have to get rid of Grant. Why? Didn't he win? Yes, but he just threw his men at the enemy. Isn't that the point? Also, he's a loony drunk. Well, what does he like to drink? I believe whiskey, sir. Then send him more. Lincoln watched as his cabinet did nothing but bicker, and his generals did nothing. But then, worst of all, personal tragedy struck. Lincoln's young son, Willie, very much loved by the president, died of typhoid fever at the age of 11. Lincoln was a sensitive man and was heavily affected by the loss. His wife was inconsolable. But one of Lincoln's greatest traits, what made him such a great leader, was in the darkest of times, with composure and determination, he kept moving forward. He knew it was his responsibility to hold himself and his family together. And by doing so, he hoped to hold the nation together. And he had had it with McClellan's in action. Lincoln decided he was going to take control. In March 1862, Lincoln firmly ordered McClellan to once again move south towards Richmond. McClellan insisted instead they move by sea to the Virginia Peninsula and attack Richmond from the southeast. Yes, said Lincoln. Okay, anything. Lincoln held on to some of McClellan's men to defend D.C. from a nearby Stonewall Jackson wreaking havoc in the Shenandoah Valley, and he sent McClellan south. McClellan landed on the peninsula, and he began to move inland. He came up against a small Confederate army that had dug in at Yorktown. McClellan vastly outnumbered the force, but it's said that Confederate General Magruder deceived McClellan by cleverly maneuvering his smaller force and making McClellan believe he faced a huge army. No, you have way more men than them. Move forward. No. McClellan settled in for a month-long siege, giving time for Johnston to move south from Manassas and Magruder time to retreat. When he finally entered the city and found it deserted, he declared it a victory, calling his success brilliant. Then, after meeting some resistance at Williamsburg, McClellan moved to within just 20 miles of Richmond, his armies able to hear the church bells ringing in the enemy capital. You still outnumber them. Go give them hell. No. McClellan once again held back, moving slowly and defensively, and with his army split in two, the Confederates saw an opportunity to strike back. McClellan's advance was halted, and now the Confederates pulled an ace out of their sleeve. General Lee, you're up. Do you think we should evacuate Richmond? No, Mr. President, no need. General Robert E. Lee, one of the most brilliant military commanders of the time, was now in charge. One of his biggest strengths was his ability to read the mind of his enemy, and he knew McClellan was cautious and weak. After moving Stonewall Jackson south to join him, and even though he had a smaller army, Lee hit McClellan in a series of fast-paced, close combat battles that had McClellan spooked. McClellan retreated the Union army back again and again and again, escaping the peninsula and returning to DC. Lee had defeated McClellan, and the campaign had failed. Well, that was a major success. A success? Tell me exactly what was successful about that. Well, we successfully retreated. You lost. I didn't lose. I merely failed to win. Things just kept looking worse for the North. 
At least their navy had seen some success, capturing a number of key port cities, notably when they steamrolled past Confederate forts to take New Orleans. And speaking of the navy, both sides had begun using ironclads. So that's pretty cool. But in the east, they still weren't having any luck. After McClellan's disastrous campaign, Lincoln briefly sent out one General John Pope to attack Northern Virginia. Hey man, just checking in. How's it going? Well, the Confederates kicked my butt at Cedar Mountain. Then they raided my camp and ran off with my money and clothes. Also, I appear to have been wedgied. Lee defeated Pope at yet another battle at Bull Run, in which nearby farm families once again got caught up in the fighting. Hurry up, Martha! There's another war out here! I'm waiting for my hair to dry! Wilmer McLean, sick of war, moved his family south, where he knew the war would definitely, absolutely, never touch him again. But Lincoln had yet another problem to contend with. European powers, in particular the UK, were looking increasingly like they may intervene diplomatically on the side of the Confederates. They were missing their precious supply of southern cotton because of the Union blockade, and they wanted to see a swift conclusion to the war. The tension between America and Great Britain had been increasing, especially after Confederate diplomats were discovered on a British ship. Now, after McClellan's failure to take Richmond, the UK declared it impossible for the North to win. Lincoln needed something to prevent Europe from getting involved, and after more petitioning from abolitionists, he decided maybe the time was finally right to make the war about ending the institution he hated, slavery. If the North had a noble cause to fight for, Europe would be less likely to intervene. But Lincoln and his cabinet knew before they could declare something as radical as emancipation, they needed a victory, especially now that the Confederates were about to go on the attack. Aware that he had a limited number of men and supplies, Lee now hoped that if he could just threaten Washington DC militarily, he would gain Europe's recognition and crush Northern morale in time for the midterm elections, forcing the North to negotiate. With confidence at an all-time high, for the first time, Robert E. Lee invaded the North. But on September 13th, the North finally had some luck. Oh boy, it's my lucky day! A cigar in a field! Hey, what's this wrapped around it? Oh my gosh! That's right, the North had discovered General Lee's battle plans wrapped around some cigars. And in them, they saw that Lee had split up his forces. McClellan headed out from DC, and the two sides met in the Battle of Antietam, a crucial battle that would decide the course of the war. It saw the most vicious fighting to date, and still remains the single bloodiest day in American history. But for once, the North came out victorious, and Lee was forced to retreat. He's on the run. Chase him down and finish him off. No. You know what, old buddy, old pal? You're fired. The North had won their crucial victory. Lincoln breathed a huge sigh of relief, and with that win, he was prepared to take a huge step. On September 22nd, the Emancipation Proclamation was issued. In January, all slaves held in the Confederate States would be, as far as the US government was concerned, officially free. Throughout the North, free black men and women rejoiced, knowing that if the North were to win, their brothers and sisters would no longer be held in bondage. The proclamation also had the intended effect on Europe, who were not willing to oppose a pledge to end slavery. An outraged Confederacy knew that Lincoln had given the war a new meaning. It was no longer just about the preservation of the Union. Now, it was about creating a new Union, washed clean of its original sin. A Union without slavery. As the Union's struggle to take control in the East continued, elsewhere, the war raged on. The Confederates attempted an invasion of Kentucky, hoping the state as a whole would join them, but they were pushed back. The Indian Territory saw Native American tribes ally with one side or the other in the hopes of securing rights after the war. Along the Mississippi, General Ulysses S. Grant remained one of the few Union generals scoring major victories. With his best pal, General Sherman, by his side, Grant led his armies down the Mississippi to the Confederate stronghold of Vicksburg. Both sides knew that if Vicksburg fell, the Confederacy would be split in two, and the Confederates prepared for an intense defense of the city. But back in the East, Lincoln still wanted somebody to march south and take Richmond. Having given General McClellan the boot, he needed a new man in charge. All right, Mr. President, option one is General Hooker. Bit of a nutcase, but a good general. Option two, his qualifications are his name is Burnside and he has freaking dope ass sideburns. Say no more. So General Burnside was put in charge of the Army of the Potomac and sent south. Lincoln hoped he finally had a general who could succeed. Burnside met General Lee at the city of Fredericksburg, where he intended to rapidly cross the river and take the city. But the Union War Department was too slow in delivering the pontoon bridges and the two sides were forced to camp across from each other, close enough to speak. Hey Yankee, Ready to get your butt kicked? Yeah, right, Rebel. God is on our side. No way! God's on our side! Oh, you think so? Well, why don't we ask him? Hey, God, whose side are you on? Ow. 
Dude, uncool. With over 100,000 men, the Union Army finally launched their massive attack on the 11th of December. But by now, the Confederates had amassed their forces. During the battle, wave after wave of brave Union men marched headlong into a brutal Confederate onslaught. Even the Confederates couldn't believe what they were seeing. And in one moment of camaraderie, a Confederate sergeant, unable to take it, reportedly came out into the field to tend to the Union wounded. Seeing this, the Union troops held their fire. Still, Burnside and his forces were soundly defeated at Fredericksburg and forced to retreat. Lincoln's popularity and Northern morale continued to plummet, especially as the winter heading into 1863 was bad. The winter camps were rife with disease. The food was less than appealing. On both sides, men began to leave. Hey, where do you think you're going? I'm deserting. What? Don't you love your country? Yes, I do. And I'm trying to get back to it as quick as I can. Lincoln, ever the kind and caring man he was, spent much of his time pardoning deserters' death sentences. Oh my, here's a 17-year-old boy sentenced to be hanged. Well, I'd better suspend his sentence. Or he'll be suspended tomorrow. Oh. <sighs> what? To try to keep the numbers up, both sides had introduced conscription. There was controversy in the North, however, since rich men could simply pay to have someone else fight on their behalf. Riots broke out in New York City with enraged mobs furious at the idea of going to fight for slaves, an idea that many of them simply did not support. However, after so much pressure, the Union had finally begun allowing black men to enlist, and these men, knowing what they were fighting for, signed up. By the end of the war, nearly 200,000 troops, 10% of the Union Army, would be black. The valor and bravery they showed throughout, silencing critics. Okay, well that last guy was useless. Let's try this Hooker fellow. General Joseph Hooker was put in charge of the Army of the Potomac, and once again, Lincoln ordered him to move south and take Richmond. Hooker met Lee at the Battle of Chancellorsville, where Hooker had over twice the men Lee did. Lee was forced to defy all military convention and split his smaller force into two. Lee had absolutely no chance of winning, and Lee won. It was his masterpiece. Lee did suffer one significant loss during the battle, though. As his right-hand man, Stonewall Jackson, was riding back to the Confederate lines at night, the nervous Confederate troops, unable to recognize him, opened fire. You boys done goofed up. Jackson died eight days later. As for Lincoln, he couldn't believe it. It was yet another loss, and Northern support continued to waver. While the Union kept on struggling in the East, out West, unconditional surrender Grant was making moves as always. In an attempt to take Vicksburg on the Mississippi, he made a series of risky and bold movements. He sent a cavalry raid and feigned Sherman North to confuse the enemy. Then, aided by a fleet of ironclads on the river, he raced his army south to cross the Mississippi. Aware that the terrain to the north was restrictive, instead, he strategically moved northeast, hitting Vicksburg's supply line and defending his rear from Confederate armies in Jackson. Once he reached Vicksburg, the Confederate defense became hardened and Grant was forced to settle in for a month-long siege, during which time he got rather bored. Despite not taking the city, Lincoln loved it and encouraged Grant to hold firm. It would only be a matter of time before the Mississippi was in Union hands. Around this time, the people in the west of Virginia, who had remained loyal to the Union throughout, finally broke away to form their own state. They could have named it anything in the world, but the creative minds at the time came up with the ingenious West Virginia. Back in Washington, Lincoln once again wanted a new general to take command. Oh my goodness, why do all these 19th century generals look so bust? Look, we got Sleepy Eyes Joe here. That's Princess Leia with a mustache. E.T. phone the doctor. Fine, why don't we give Snapping Turtle McGee here a shot? So General Snapping Turtle McGee was put in charge of the Army of the Potomac. And it was a crucial time for the Union, because once again, the Confederates decided to go on the attack. So far, they had done exceedingly well militarily. But as the war kept going, the Confederate economy was crumbling. Riots broke out in the streets of Richmond as the price of bread skyrocketed. Supplies were dwindling. Jefferson Davis wanted to send men west to rescue Vicksburg. But General Lee knew the longer the war lasted, the worse their chances got. And he still hoped if he could just threaten DC, the already demoralized North would surrender. So in June 1863, with the momentum behind him, General Lee once again entered the North, fighting his way through Maryland and into Pennsylvania. General Meade set out to meet him for what would be the most significant battle of the entire war. If the Confederates won, DC could fall. If the Union won, it would be a turning point as the Confederates would run out of steam and the small town that was to get caught up in the crossfire of the largest battle in American history was Gettysburg, Pennsylvania.
On June 1st, units from each army encountered one another and skirmished through the town itself. The townspeople were forced to take refuge, except for one man who reportedly ran outside for a strange reason. Joseph, what are you doing? I'm not gonna let them take my beans. How many times do I have to tell you they're not here for your beans? By the second day, over 100,000 men stretched for miles across the battlefield. Lee took the initiative, deciding to hit the enemy's flanks, and he came very close to breaking through the Union's disorganized left. But Union Colonel Joshua Chamberlain ordered a desperate bayonet charge, smashing into the Confederates and forcing them back. The Union forces held across the line. On the final day, Lee believed the Union Army had fortified its flanks, so he decided to finish them off with one massive central assault. The Confederates rushed at the Union lines during General Pickett's charge, and this time, it was the Union's turn to unleash hell. Meade had correctly guessed Lee's strategy, and the Confederates were decimated, forced to turn and flee. A devastated General Lee called out to his fleeing and wounded men, telling them it was his fault. And after holding for a counterattack that never came, he ordered a retreat back into Virginia. The North had just managed to score a massive victory, and one they desperately needed. And if that wasn't enough, in the West, after a month-long siege, Vicksburg finally fell. The North now held the Mississippi. And better yet, it was the 4th of July. With control of the Mississippi, Union forces moved into Arkansas and Tennessee. Tennessee in particular saw heavy fighting, with Union General Rosecrans masterfully pushing Braxton Bragg's Army of the Tennessee out of Tennessee. He suffered a major setback, however, at the Bloody Battle of Chickamauga and ended up under a Confederate siege at Chattanooga. At one point during the siege, a temporary truce was declared so that wounded men could be recovered. And often in the Civil War, during these small truces, men from both sides would meet in the middle to trade things like tobacco, coffee, Thankfully, General Grant, now in charge of all Western Union armies, showed up and karate kicked Bragg right back into Georgia. Like this. With Sherman and Hooker, Grant took on Confederate positions in the mountains around the city, including the famous battle above the clouds and Mission Ridge. Grant continued to be Lincoln's number one guy. With these victories, Lincoln hoped the war was finally turning. Back in Gettysburg, the entire town had been turned into a hospital to care for the scores of wounded men. Throughout the war, on both sides, Women such as Clara Barton rose to the occasion, doing crucial work on the home front and volunteering as nurses. For those who had given their lives, a new national cemetery was to be established at Gettysburg, and Abraham Lincoln traveled out to attend the opening ceremony. At the event, the main speaker spoke for two hours. Then, Abraham Lincoln was called forward to give some brief, appropriate remarks. In just two minutes, he masterfully and poignantly iterated America's national purpose and the need to continue the fight. The Gettysburg Address would become one of the most famous speeches in American history. While they were now making progress, the North still couldn't find a decisive victory in the East. And that was bad news for Lincoln, because his presidency was now in its fourth year. In 1864, there was an election coming. The Confederates knew this too, and with little hope left of being able to threaten the North militarily, they believed their last shot at victory may be in the election, since Lincoln, emancipation, and the war itself weren't exactly popular. People in the North were sick of war and wanted to put it behind them. Robert E. Lee hoped that if he could just hold out and continue to inflict more defeats, the people of the North would vote Lincoln out and replace him with a Southern sympathizer who may be willing to negotiate. Lincoln knew now he desperately needed a victory. Now, I know what you're thinking, but oversimplified. If Lincoln loves General Grant so much, then why doesn't he put him in charge of the campaign in the East? Well, guess what, loyal subscriber? You've hit the nail on the head. You're bold, Grant. I'll grant you that. I'm promoting you to General-in-Chief, and I ain't taking you for granted. Now, I want you to go defeat Lee. Grant me my wish. Please stop. So Grant was put in charge and he came up with a new plan. He wanted to press the Confederates on all fronts, with General Banks to capture Mobile, Alabama, General Sherman moving south to Atlanta, and Grant joining the Army of the Potomac as they advanced through Virginia. In May 1864, that plan went into action. Sherman steadily advanced on Atlanta, facing off against the smaller Confederate army under General Joseph E. Johnston. In addition, a cruel yet highly skilled cavalry general and winner of the funniest Confederate statue award, Nathan Bedford Forrest, was also nearby doing his best to threaten Sherman's advance. But in a series of battles, Sherman dominated and pushed Johnson back to the city. But he was held just outside of Atlanta itself and was forced to lay siege. Meanwhile, the main show was happening to the east in Virginia. The Union's top general was finally about to face off against the Confederacies. Lincoln hoped Grant would bring something new to the Eastern Theater, and bring something new 
He did. As Grant began moving south, Lee still regularly outmaneuvered him and inflicted heavy casualties, hoping to demoralize the North as much as he could. But here's what set Grant apart from others. He knew Lee was running out of men and that the North by comparison had plenty. Grant would throw his forces at Lee, and even when Lee repelled them, Grant, rather than pulling back, would give the order to keep moving forward and flank Lee again and again. In under six weeks, 80,000 men would be killed, wounded, or missing. In DC, Grant was criticized for being a butcher. At the Battle of the Wilderness, the Union casualties were so heavy that Grant reportedly began to weep. But still, Grant could replace his losses. Lee couldn't, and he was being pushed all the way back to Richmond. Lee knew once he got there, he'd be under siege. Then, it would only be a matter of time. Close to Richmond, Grant again suffered horrific casualties in a miscalculated assault at Cold Harbor. Then, trying to be a tricksty trickster, instead of moving on Richmond directly, Grant moved towards Petersburg to flank the Confederate capital and cut its supply line. But, just like Sherman, Grant was halted outside of the city, and he too was forced to settle in for a siege. Two identical sieges would not be good enough for Lincoln's re-election. The people of the North saw the casualties Grant had been taking, and they weren't happy. To make matters worse, Lee had sent Jubal Early north to threaten DC, with the hope of forcing Grant to withdraw troops from Richmond. Early was repelled on the outskirts of the city, with President Lincoln even attending as an observer, but the North had been given a fright. So with the war currently in a stalemate, who was to be Lincoln's opponent in the critical 1864 election? Who would the Democrats choose? Guess what, baby? I'm back. That's right. General George B. McClellan would run for president against Abraham Lincoln. My fellow countrymen, if you elect me, I, the great General George McClellan, will fearlessly and valiantly win the war. Unlike this douchebag, many Democrats, however, including McClellan's running mate, wanted to end the war. So it's possible McClellan may have ended up fearlessly and valiantly making peace with the Confederates, which is exactly what they were hoping for. With the war in a stalemate and Lincoln still not popular, it looked like McClellan would win and the Confederacy may have a chance at surviving after all. Lincoln himself said that without some kind of major victory, it seemed exceedingly probable that this administration will not be re-elected. Well, fret not, Abe, because if it's a major victory you want, it's a major victory you'll get. Atlanta had been under siege by General Sherman for just over a month. After a number of battles around the city, Sherman sent a force south to sever the city's supply line, and Confederate General Hood was forced to abandon it. Atlanta, one of the Confederacy's most important cities, had fallen into Union hands. For many, it was clear that the Confederacy's defeat was now inevitable, and the war would soon be over. When the final results came in, Lincoln had won with an Electoral College landslide, with the troops in particular voting overwhelmingly for Lincoln, which must have been touching for their commander-in-chief. Hey man, looks like you lost. No hard feelings? I didn't lose. I merely failed to win. In January, Lincoln involved himself heavily in ensuring the 13th Amendment made it through Congress. In a narrow and historic vote, the amendment passed. Slavery would now be constitutionally banished throughout the nation. Black men and women watching the vote from the galleries knew the work had only just begun. A couple months later, at his second inauguration, with victory right around the corner, he didn't celebrate, he didn't gloat. Instead, he emphasized the need for reunification and binding up wounds. To him, Americans, North or South, were to again be compatriots. However, listening to Lincoln speak that day was a man who had no interest in reunification, John Wilkes Booth. An actor living in DC was also a deep Southern sympathizer. And as the war turned against the Confederacy, depressed and full of hate, he was already plotting his revenge on the man he held responsible. With further Confederate losses, it was pretty clear at this point who would win. But still, Jefferson Davis showed no sign of giving in. The North were frustrated to see the conflict being dragged out. Why waste more lives in Atlanta? General Sherman believed he had the key to forcing the Confederacy's hand. He had an unusually modern concept that an army could only survive with the support of the people. Strike at the people and the army collapses. Sherman decided to do something unprecedented. He would remove his 62,000 men from their supply line and march through the heartland of the Confederacy where they would live off the land. There, they would wreak havoc. As they marched, they tore up railroads, burned farms, and destroyed communication lines. They also liberated thousands of slaves. The damage done was estimated at $1.4 billion. The tactics were cruel, but to Sherman, it was better than losing yet more men in battle. In December, he reached Savannah, Georgia, but he wasn't done yet. Next, he turned north to inflict his punishment on the first state to secede, South Carolina. 
As he moved, he came ever closer to General Lee's army, still holding out at Petersburg. The siege of Petersburg had lasted for 292 days. 60,000 of Lee's men had deserted. Numerous Union attempts to break through had failed. But when the breakthrough finally came, it came quick. On April 2nd, a Union assault finally pushed the Confederates from their defenses. Hey man, there's no need to evacuate, right? You'll rescue us like last time, right? Sorry, can't hear you. Lee narrowly escaped the city, hoping he'd be able to meet up with General Johnson and continue the fight. Grant chased him down. Richmond was evacuated, and Jefferson Davis went on the run. As they left, the Confederates set fire to military buildings, but the flames burnt out of control, and as the Union troops arrived, they became firefighters. A couple of days later, Abraham Lincoln visited the war-torn city. Grant caught up to Lee at Appomattox Courthouse, where he trapped his forces. It was here, on April 9, 1865, that Lee saw no point in continuing. Uh, sir? Listen, bub. I drank a bit too much last night, and now I'm hanging like a fruit bat on a hot day. So whatever you have to say, I don't want to hear it. Uh, General Lee says he wants to surrender. Hot diggity dog! Grant and Lee met in the home of a nearby farm family, owned by a man who had tried his best to escape the Civil War years earlier. Wilmer McLean. All right, can we all just hurry up and get this over with? Martha! Not now! I'm cleaning! Do you want us to get rats? Grant and Lee after years of war, now spoke respectfully to one another. When Lee left, his face filled with emotion, Grant's men began to cheer, but Grant ordered them to stop. He knew that now was the time for reconciliation. Just over two weeks later, General Johnson would surrender to Sherman, ending the war for 89,000 Confederate soldiers in the largest surrender of the war. Not every Confederate state had surrendered, but the war was as good as over. Across the North, church bells rang out and celebrations erupted, in Washington, Lincoln gave a speech from the White House to a jubilant crowd, in which, among various things, he expressed his support for black voting rights. Lincoln had seen the nation through its deepest crisis. The presidency had visibly aged him. He had lost over 20 pounds. He said sometimes, I think I am the tiredest man on earth. I'm not sure tiredest is a word, but geez, the man's exhausted. Cut him some slack. On a carriage ride with Mary, Lincoln clearly was looking forward to being a president in a time of peace. He was apparently very cheerful, surprising his wife, and he told her that between the war and the loss of their son, they'd both been very miserable. Now, it was time to be happy. On the evening of April 14th, Lincoln attended a play with his wife and some friends at Ford's Theater. It was a comedy, and the president appeared to be enjoying it very much. In a nearby bar, John Wilkes Booth swallowed two glasses of brandy. He slipped quietly into the president's booth and awaited for the audience's laughter to rise. The president was shot in the back of the head. Booth fled the city. Soldiers carried Lincoln to a boarding house across the street. There, doctors declared there was nothing they could do. Surrounded by his heartbroken wife, son, and members of cabinet, at 7.22 the next morning, President Lincoln passed away. Never before had a president been murdered. A shocked nation mourned as a 12-day funeral procession carried Lincoln back to his home in Springfield, Illinois. On April 26th, Union Cavalry found John Wilkes Booth in a barn in Virginia, where he was shot. Not long after, Confederate President Jefferson Davis was also tracked down and arrested. Imprisoned for two years, he was eventually released. The North didn't want to put him on trial for fear the jury may rule that Southern secession had in fact been legal. To ensure reconciliation, other Confederate generals and politicians were allowed to re-enter life in the now restored Union. Scattered fighting continued into May, when the last Confederate forces in Texas disintegrated. The southern states came under northern military occupation to prevent any further rebellion, and a very difficult era of Reconstruction began. Over three million Americans had fought, brother against brother. The Civil War remains the bloodiest conflict in U.S. history. But the Union had been preserved. You could say the real winners were those who were to never again be slaves. Further amendments passed by Congress gave black individuals the right to citizenship and to vote. Significant progress had been made. However, entering into the 20th century, it was clear the fight for equality would continue. In modern America, the man who fought to preserve the nation and never gave up in the darkest of times stands as a symbol of honesty, empathy, humility, perseverance, and courage a continuous reminder of what has forged America.
and what it should ever strive to be.